Ledger is a lower P podcast about writing. I'm your host, Austin Wilson. Welcome, my friends. I appreciate you being here and checking the episode out. Today, I'm joined by poet Emily Marie Passos Duffy. She's an author of the poetry collection called Hemorrhaging Want and Water. It's out now from Perennial Press and available on the Perennial Press website. I'm going to link that in the show notes along with everything else that I mentioned here in the intro. It's kind of hard to beat the publisher's description of what the book is, so I'll just give you that. And that is Pastoral City Smut for Bad Girls with Big Hearts. Uh, And if that sounds like it's your thing, then you might want to check the book out. Her poetry, it it travels the globe, uh, hops across borders of of genre and form. Uh, Emily and I chat about the connective thematic tissue between all of her poems Uh, Whether it's there or not, her use of a a character that she has named Alias that shows up in in multiple poems, when and where humor flows into her work and how we do talk about capital P poetry versus uh, lowercase p poetry. That'll make more sense once you once you hear what the context of that is. I was particularly interested in her use of the, the personal pronoun I within her poems and or kind of any poem, really, and whether or not poems can exist outside of typical fiction and nonfiction classifications. We dive pretty uh, pretty much headfirst into the craft of writing, and, and there is swearing, so prepare yourself for that. Check out Emily's stuff online. You can, you can follow her on Instagram at Duffy Lala. That's D as in dog, U-F-F-Y-L-A-L-A. Uh, you can find a link tree there to her work and everything else that she has going on. As for my stuff, uh, I do have a new story out on, on Defenestration. It's, uh, the website is defenestrationmag.net. Again, there will be a link to that in the show notes. Uh, my story is called Men's Rights Activist Resurrect Charles Bronson. Uh, it was published in the April 2023 collection of stories. Uh, it's about necromancy and... Uh, this is the kind of the elevator pitch I've been giving everyone. It's about necromancy and some reliably idiotic jackasses. But two bigger things, I actually have an official Ledger Discord channel opened, and right now it's currently me and my best friend David <laughs> in it, no one else, but there's an open link on the link tree that I'm going to make sure is in the show notes if you want to come by and chat about writing, the shows in general, books. But bigger news is that Ledger is now a member of the Writer's Bone podcast network alongside a bunch of other great writing shows, including the Writer's Bone show itself, which has something like 500 episodes. It's been going forever and interviewed a ton of amazing people, so make sure you check that out but as for now here's my interview with emily marie paso stuffy your book hemorrhaging want and water is out now from perennial press it actually came out in march of 2023 this year so congratulations on that thank you thank you so much that's kind of the first thing i want to talk about is the process of putting the book together your writing process leading up to the book being published and the length of time that it took from from you writing poems and having the book come together. Kind of walk me through that entire process and and how it felt and what it feels like now. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. And it's such a big question right. um, <laughs> because <laughs> the process of um, putting a full-length poetry book together is very non-linear. This is my first book, and I learned so much along the way. You know, um, the writing feels like kind of just a small fraction of it. Um, (laughs) And, you know, there's revision um, and, of course, kind of the, like, I guess, um, post-production aspects, too, that I'm in now, you know, like, sharing it and um, but it really takes a village and I'm so thankful to the team at Perennial Press. Um, they actually did two rounds of internal revisions with me. Um, so I got a lot of developmental um, you know suggestions and they really helped me sort of shape the manuscript into um, what it eventually became and uh, was published as. So I guess that since I started there I'll kind of work, backwards from mm-hmm. there. Um, so the the manuscript itself um, was completed in 2018. Um, and, you know, these were poems that I had started writing like a decade ago. Um, and it, it sort of culminated in my creative thesis at Naropa University. Um, the writer Michelle Naka Pierce was my supervisor. 
and um, we we did a lot of work together, a lot of sort of contemplative practices that she offered to me um, to kind of drive at what it is I was circling around with these poems. Um, and these poems are sort of like a a kept promise to my 18 year old self, uh, <laughs> sort of, and, and the kind of, um, you know, the center of gravity of the manuscript really is a lot of experiences that I had, um, as a young woman living, living abroad for, for the first time. Um, so the poems sort of, you know, constellated around experiences of living in different cities, um, explorations of, memory, place, and desire, and sort of this question of um, how do the places that we inhabit uh, form or shape our identities um, and and who we become. And so that's sort of, uh, I guess, a really nonlinear synopsis of um, how the book came together. But yeah, there were lots of um, writing and also revision practices that led to uh, it becoming book shaped. <laughs> yeah. So was the promise to your 18 year old self that you would produce a book? Was it a promise that you would sort of mine the, the feelings of the experiences that you had had? What was kind of walk me through the, a little more what that promise was to yourself, because like you said, it's a long process to get something into book shape and, I am also so so interested in in you hear, hearing you say that the writing is a lot smaller aspect of the entire process because that's something that I'm super interested in too is just knowing where the writing fits into everything else that helps a book turn into a book. So help me understand the promise to yourself and then a little bit more of of how you looked at the writing as you know a smaller part of the the larger thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So the promise, I think, um, it was a little of both of those elements that you, that you mentioned. I think that, um, you know, when, when we're 18 years old, everything is so intense. Um, and, right. uh, <laughs> and, and I happen to have also very intense experiences as an 18 year old. I lived, um, in Salvador, uh, in the state of Bahia in Brazil, um, which is, uh, my mother's Brazilian. Um, she was born in Rio and I wanted to go to Brazil, um, after high school and kind of reconnect with that side of, you know, my culture and, um, you know, get a little more fluent in, in the language and, um, it ended up just being such a, such a wild ride, um, <laughs> you know, like really thrown in over my head. It's, um, it's a very, uh, you know, complicated place, rich with history. Um, and it's also a, a dangerous city, you know, so I experienced yeah. a lot of things that, um, that, that shaped me and, and a lot of things that were traumatic, for example, being robbed and, um, you know, all those sorts of things that, you know, are intense for someone at any age and being 18 years old, it was just like, whoa. Right. Um, and so it was a, it was a whirlwind and I actually had to come back early and, um, you know, lived with my grandparents in Florida for a little bit. And, and I was just trying to make sense of everything that had happened to me. And I remember sitting, um, in Florida, like uh, at my grandparents' house thinking, you know, I have no idea what all of this means, but someday I'm going to write a book. Um, and I think at that time I thought that it would be kind of like a memoir or, you know, something like that. I didn't imagine it would be poetry, but I remember that very vividly, like, okay, I, I don't know why all these things happened. And um, what to make of them, but but one day I'll write a book. Um, yeah. And sort of that was the promise. And I think coming back, you know, over a decade later, reconnecting with that um, self that made the promise, it feels like kind of a a completion of a cycle. Um, 
in a lot of ways. So I think that also connects with the the other aspect and hearing you say a decade later, because I, I assume over that decade you were you were writing. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So were you writing poetry regularly? You said you were thinking potentially the the book you wanted to produce would have been a memoir, but it ended up being poetry. So were you focused on prose versus poems or how did the the on-ramp to to get to the book of poetry happen? Yeah, so I think that I've always really considered myself a cross-genre or hybrid writer. Um, I'm really drawn to writing prose, um, but I also love the formal possibilities of poetry. And I think that you can pack, you can almost pack a lot more into a poem. You know, it's almost like more economic (laughs) to write a poem in a lot of ways, because you can really... um, you can do so much uh, with with poetry, um, and the the MFA that I did was actually a cross genre MFA, which is one of the reasons I was drawn to it because um, I was like I don't really categorize myself as a fiction or creative nonfiction writer or a poet. Um, I feel like both of these things are are appealing to me. Um, so you know, I was writing. I was always kind of writing. A little bit of both, um, and and journaling and stuff. And when I got to, uh, you know, throughout my undergraduate years, and also, um, especially in the master's program, I got to experiment um, with form a little mm-hmm. bit more. And I do the book. I do actually consider it to be hybrid in some ways because I write prose poems. I write pieces that could you know, someone could even categorize it maybe as uh, like a flash fiction piece or, you know, things like that. And so I really felt like I started to kind of thrive in an environment where experimentation, which is such a loaded word, like what is experimentation when it comes (laughs) to writing? Um, All writing is kind of an experiment um, and and most of it fails, (laughs) but it's like, um, you know, I, yeah, I started just playing with form. And I think that um, the the program that I did, we we produced a, a critical essay as part of our degree and also a creative manuscript. And those were very much in conversation with each other too. So I guess um, I was I was writing both in both forms and then the book um, it I consider it to be cross genre, although it is uh, it is poetry. Um, well, it's funny because as I was reading it, the opening poem is a is a prose poem. It, it is one of those that you mentioned that sort of feels almost flash fictiony, and a little less uh, tied to you know the the form of poetry. Um, but all of that kind of ties up into the into my next question, which is about genre classifications. And because as I was reading uh, hemorrhaging want and water, I was thinking about how you were thinking of the the poems as you were writing them, um, how you were thinking about genre, if they were, you know, classified as fiction or nonfiction, or if that's even a part of the, your process or craft at all. And I, I started getting really excited to think about forms of writing that can exist outside of those classifications. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if, and if poems can even just be like, this is not nonfiction, this is not fiction, this is a poem. Mm -hmm. And, if that matches up at all with with ways that you were thinking or how you were approaching uh, genre classifications as you were writing, or even if you did. Yeah, um, that is such a, a great and layered question. And I think that the question of genre is, um, it's troubling because it's like yeah. <laughs> for writers, because you also, you know, I think that there's a level of genre that's like, okay, when when a piece of writing is a product that people are going to read and consume, how, how are you going to present it to them? Um, right. You know, like I could also call this book a memoir or an anti-memoir and, you know, that, that could be as equally valid. Um, right. Something that I appreciate about poetry is that it does feel um, a little more or a little less boundaried in terms of uh, readers' expectations for what an encounter with that genre is going to look like or feel like. 
And so I think that for me, I'm, I'm drawn to like poetry as, um, as a practice, um, and as kind of a, um, a tradition that feels, um, very radical, um, and, you know, something that is constantly reinventing itself and something that is so tied to the breath and body and oral tradition. Um, so I feel, yeah, like an inclination towards, um, towards poetry, but also, um, kind of always an existential crisis about what kind of writer I am and, (laughs) you know, like what, um, where this, this work falls. And I, um, I'm glad that it's classified as poetry, but I'm also open to people saying like, well, this feels a little more, um, you know, narrative. And I think as a writer, I am, um, I'm, I'm drawn to narrative, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm drawn to, you know, structures of storytelling that feel, um, that feel familiar. Um, but I'm also interested in like breaking apart those, those structures and, um, you know, subverting expectations. And, um, I mean, I can talk about, I, I feel like also, uh, thinking about genre, I, I think about form as well. Um, because those, those questions feel, uh, like really closely related. Um, because I think I, I'm, when I'm writing, I'm a little more preoccupied with like, what is the form of this rather than like, what is the genre? If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, so do you think that poetry, I, I more accurately, I guess, interfaces with the ways that we feel, whereas prose, uh, maybe is more us reaching for rational explanations where like, if I'm telling a story and I'm telling it, you know, in, in sentence structure, I'm using prose. Um, I'm putting a, pretty, I don't want to say strict, but a pretty accepted form on the story. And with poetry, like the way my thoughts and emotions work, they don't express themselves in like these really tight, straightforward paragraphs. You know, it's like scattershot words. And Mm -hmm. does that make sense with how you, are you trying to, to bring these things out of you that are maybe less easy to understand and then trying to to put them on the page in a way where they're a little easier to understand, but not in like a paragraph. Totally. Yeah. I, I love that question. And I think that um, it makes me think about access and intimacy. Um, yeah. And in some ways, poetry can really feel like both, um, you know, as a writer and also thinking about this from the perspective of a reader of poetry, because I love reading poetry, um, it can really feel like a direct transmission in some ways, right? like um, this sort of immediacy and access to, um, to an emotion that feels very alive. Um, yeah. And I also think that that's possible in prose. I think that there are writers that have um taken on the challenge of how do you keep a a feeling alive and transmitted in prose um right i'm thinking about i i really love so the french writer um helene sisu her uh book of promethea um translated by betsy wing um is this love story and it's it's really phenomenal and it's sort of told um, in a way that is trying to like not kill the feeling through writing it. Um, yeah. And so I think that this is always like the challenge for prose writers too. And I'm like so impressed with writers who manage to keep that pulse um, really alive in prose. I'm thinking about um Ocean Vuong's uh, On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous, which is a novel yeah. Um, and, you know, works that, that manage to kind of maintain that transmission or at least take care of those, um, those moments that are really live, like the, the prose around those like directly transmitted 
emotions makes a little kind of like home for it, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're writing, when you're writing poetry, do you feel when you have, I don't want to say succeeded because that's such a, (laughs) that's such a hard thing to feel, obviously, as we're writing, because we, you know, we put the the words out into the world and then we're, we kind of don't know until somebody tells us that they connected with them. How, when, when do you feel something when you're writing a poem where you are like, this is done or I know it's not done yet, but I know that I have to be done with it now. I, I love the idea of, of thinking about the craft in, in general and just kind of getting a sense of how you, how you do it as you're, as you're writing. When do you feel like a poem is done? Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the annoying answer is like the, a poem is never done, (laughs) Um, but I think that there's like an internal, um, sense of maybe not satisfaction or correctness, maybe precision. Precision is the word I'm looking for. Like, um, when I feel like I've managed to render something precisely, um, according to, you know, whatever, whatever I'm driving at. And this, this can be so, um, this can vary so much, you know, um, yeah. and really depend on what it is I'm writing, what I'm trying to, um, to drive at. Um, because I also, I want to make myself feel something, um, right. you know, and so as I'm, I'm writing, I'm also, feeling and I'm thinking about also what someone might feel or access um when they read it, which of course is highly subjective. Um and right. I'm never gonna be able to to predict um, you know, how how this is being received. But um it really I mean I do write with my my body. My body is like a diagnostic tool um when I'm writing poetry. And I think that there's this like sensation of when I get the language not right or correct but you know when it's like a closest approximation to the thing that I'm trying to convey or render I'm like okay this is this is close yeah if that makes sense do you think no yeah it does I I think it's such a hard thing to to zero in on as writing where you're like, I did it. (laughs) We're like, I'm done because it's such a, with such a nebulous feeling. And in my experience, it goes quickly and it's always the kind of the thing that I'm searching for Mm -hmm. when you start a poem. And, and this is just a, a real straightforward, like nuts and bolts question. Like is the title in mind? Are you exploring imagery? Are you pulling from, everything or, or or are you really focusing down where you're like okay I have started and I really want to try to get to this image um I'm I'm ma- imagining it differs every single poem but what's maybe kind of the median experience mm-hmm. yeah I love that you just use the word nebulous because I feel like that's just a it's a really great word for sort of the sensation of or, or the question of like, where do poems come from? <laughs> um, <laughs> right. And I think that, yeah, just um, kind of thinking about, uh, you know, the book, it's definitely a, a combination of where do I start from? Um, a lot of the poems in this book start from the experience of walking in cities. And okay. um many of them are like image based or sensation based. Um, and so usually when I'm walking or so many of my poems start on public transportation, um, many, if not most of my poems start in my iPhone notes. Um, and it's like a little stem. So I might have a, a, a line or even just like a, a word pair that kind of emerges. Um, and you know, I, I build from that. Um, I might see something or hear something. Um, and that becomes sort of like an impetus for a poem. Um, and a lot of poetry too feels like 
I'm dialoguing with myself, um, testing my own thinking. Um, and so I think, yeah, they, they sort of emerged from, from that place. And, and the, the poems in, in Hemorrhaging Wants and Water are, um, are really image and, um, and sensory based sort of this, like, how do I, um, I like the word render. I've been using it a lot. Like, how do I render or how do I approach, um, you know, the sensation of like the sun setting over the water in this particular city and how it, how can I communicate, um, how it feels like other cities that I've been in? Um, you know, how can I kind of capture this really, um, body-based experience that feels highly personal, but also shared? Right. It does come across as a more, and here I mean poetry as more painterly mm-hmm. in a, than prose does sometimes. Obviously there are those prose stylists out there where you're like, oh my gosh, this person is putting this image in my head expertly. But with poetry, especially in my, as I'm reading some of your stuff, the, I have a question here about Golden Hour alias and Golden Hour Lisbon mm-hmm. and the connection between those three poems and... It kind of, they, like, it feels like a triptych, like these three paintings that go together, these three poems. Mm. And I was curious about when they were written in relation to one another, um, how you, or even if they are actually connected or if that's something that I, as a reader brought, um, and the other times that those, that those connections between poems maybe happen in the book. Talk to me about connecting connective tissue between some of the poems. Mm, Yeah. I love thinking about those poems as a triptych. Um, and they're, I mean, they're definitely connected. The, the, the golden hour, um, sort of like iterations are absolutely, you know, they were part of this attempt to, okay, how can I explore this, um, this thesis or this central idea of like, once you've been in one city, you've been in every city and cities become each other. And there are, you know, portals within cities to other cities. Um, And so a lot of it was, yeah, like it painterly and um, collagey, if I I can say that, like um, collagey and sort of, uh, yeah, piecing together these, these images um and i with the different cities um i created early on in the process this uh three-part venn diagram um with like three different cities that are make up the central focus of the you know cities as characters in the book um so you mean you literally like you literally came up with a like an actual visual venn diagram uh yes so i have oh, um, awesome. i actually i posted on my instagram <laughs> it's from it's oh, also yeah it's from um oh it must be 2017 yeah so i um i created a a venn diagram with three cities and I explored like the overlapping places between pairs of cities. And then the sort of middle was this dark space. And yeah. my objective was to kind of like write tunnel into that space um, between. And um, so in a lot of ways, the the poems that are focused on cities and in a way the the manuscript itself is, you know, traveling through that, that middle space, um, is also very inspired by, you know, Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities. So like, yeah, the, also this kind of idea of like storytelling and how cities really are like fictions of themselves. Like their cities are also stories. Um, and so I was really exploring that and, I think that golden hour as kind of a unifying um, connective thread or tissue or time um, was, yeah, a a way to kind of um, play with that, that possibility of like, here's a moment that happens once a day in every city, no matter where you are, um, where it kind of feels like time as we ordinarily live it 
is suspended. Um, so how can I kind of like slow things down and, um, and write into that? And, and so those, those three poems, and I guess the, the golden hour became, um, a bit of an anchor, I guess, in that exploration, I, you know, to kind of like ground myself, um, in, you know, as I'm toggling between these different, um, geographies and also playing with like, what does it look like when I zoom in really close? And what does it feel like when I'm like really far away from either, you know, thinking about looking at a city from an airplane or those um, kind of uh, considerations of proximity as well. Um, And Alias is, I can like kind of talk about Alias as a whole separate sort of topic, but that's kind of like a a persona that emerged um, in the manuscript. And so that uh, alias poem, I guess alias as a persona came later um, in the process of putting together this book, the exploration of the cities um, as characters and golden hour and the spaces in between came first and alias came later. So yeah, the, for for listeners, there are multiple golden hour poems within the book, and then Alias. The first time that I that I you know picked up on the Alias as a as a character, which is another one of my questions for you, is is Alias gets mentioned in one of those three poems where, where I was like, okay, these poems have some connective tissue, and you later have poems called like Alias Speaks and. It re- that's one of the reasons why I was really starting to, to think about genre and classification and a line from Golden Hour Lisbon was one of the lines where I was like, okay, this seems like a, a bigger theme for the entire book that I wanted to, for us to discuss. And this was kind of my, my like big question because um, at, the be- at the beginning of Golden Hour Lisbon, the line, the letter I in Latin accounts for the unknown an unquantifiable factor some might call magic. And so then after I read that and then started interacting with the rest of the poems throughout the book, I started thinking about I as a personal pronoun, but also as more of, well, I guess deeper than a character because there were poems that I read where I was like, okay, I think the I here maybe represents Emily. But also in this other poem, I think I represents me, the reader. And I wanted to talk about if, well, I guess first, if I'm, you know, putting a framework on the, on your work that, that wasn't necessarily there, or just how you thought about including I, especially in relation to that line in, in Golden Hour Lisbon. Yeah, that is such a phenomenal question. And it's, um, this is why it's so exciting. And I still like, I, I don't think I'll ever get over it. Like people's, um, readings because, uh, I think that that I thinking about, um, I as a personal pronoun, but also in connection to that line you just shared, um, is something that I hadn't considered. Um, but I think that it is really connected to the way that I approached, um, perspective and, and point of view in yeah um in the poems because the there is an instability um within within the book um yeah. in terms of identity in terms of all of these you know questions of different cities of hybridity of um you know multiculturalism and uh i think that bringing in um in alias as a character um as kind of a foil for or a twin for the eye um kind of helped the momentum of the work and I think helped me move things forward a little bit um because yeah. there's also always this thing with um poetry and I don't know if you've been in like workshop environments where People are like, okay, don't, when you're referring to the speaker of the poem, say the speaker of the poem, don't say, you know, don't assume that the speaker of the poem is, you know, the person who wrote it and 
that right. they're writing from personal experience. Um, and I mean, we're all writing from personal experience, whether it's through a character or <laughs> in some way, <laughs> or yeah. not, you know, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean, okay, everything that that appears uh, with the eye is like, you know, true or factual or, you know, actually happened in exactly that way. Um, but these are, of course, I was mining um, personal experiences and things that are, um, you know, very close to me, um, things that I've lived through, experiences that I've had in like my own subjective body and identity. And so there's absolutely this exploration of like, what, what is, what is the I, what is the self? Um, yeah. And I love the, the connection that you made to that line because, um, you know, it is unknown, but it can also be magic. And so, yeah. Well, I was, I, like I said, it, it stuck out to me as almost a larger theme of the book and was tied into alias as, as a, as a character where I was like, okay, I, it's funny because I started to think of your book more. I don't want to say more. Uh, I started to think of your book with storylines playing out and seeing alias develop as a character. Like there's a poem called alias is a fuck girl yes. <laughs> and it's four lines long, but it stuck with me. I think probably because there is some humor in it. Um, and your book manages, you know, those to switch back and forth on those tracks where you are, you know, talking about golden hour and you're doing the things that maybe the quote unquote, like non poetry writer or non poetry reader would think of when they think of poetry. Um, and this is something I've talked about in the past with, with other poets about, you know, the ways that we minimize poetry or classify poetry and seeing what poetry is capable of with a poem like alias is a fuck girl, which is four lines long, but was impactful for me on a couple levels, because one alias, you had started developing a character with your work, but then minim, uh, doing or using minimalism in, in a poem um, where those four lines talk to me about writing a poem as short as, as that one. And if it feels different to write something like that versus something longer or um, is there humor in it or was that my reading? Yeah. I mean, there's definitely, um, there's definitely humor. It's called alias as a fuck girl. <laughs> like, how is <laughs> right. it? Like, <laughs> Um, it's just like, give me an organizing principle, bitch. Um, right. <laughs> and yeah, I think that those like shorter poems and especially that one really feel like, um, like, like punctuation in a sense. Like yeah. if I'm thinking about the book as a whole, as, you know, a composition or a musical score or something like that, um, you know, it's, it's a way to kind of disrupt um, yeah. And, and I'm really interested in like the, the rhythm of a poem, but also the rhythm of the book as a whole. Like I, I like to punctuate. And so I think that, um, the character of Alias allowed me to, to punctuate or to be like, um, basic in a way yeah. of just like, also having this tone of, um, you know, because there are some philosophical things that get explored in the book. Um, but then I also love like turning and being like, well, you know, fuck this. <laughs> like, and, right. and having, um, and having those moments, because it feels really true to like, the texture of the work, um, yeah. and the themes that are getting explored. Well, that, that question of what should poetry be doing? And the ways that we kind of cast our own ideas onto it. And I, again, I, I talked about this in the past with other poets about people shitting on, you know, quote unquote, Instagram poetry mm -hmm. or poems that they think are lesser for some reason. Mm -hmm. And the ways that we as writers or even readers deal with things that we think aren't doing what they should like that poetry should be a capital P like, uh, you know, written meter and verse. And, mm -hmm. but I want to read poems like alias is a fuck girl. Mm -hmm. And I want to read poems about alias watching Anthony Bourdain and 
those are the types of things that I'm drawn to. And I'm curious about your, your arrival at those places, like uh, being like, okay, yeah, I do want to write about philosophical concepts and ideas and the way I find beauty, but I also want to write about, you know, going to the store or waking up and being pissed off. And that poetry is perfectly capable of, of doing something like, yeah, I watched Anthony Bourdain or alias watched Anthony Bourdain. Mm -hmm. Did, is that a, an ongoing process for you where you have, where you feel like you can do anything with poetry or do you ever feel like you shouldn't write a poem about certain things or? Um, I think I, I love this question so much because I think it really speaks to the ways that so many of us have been ruined by the way that poetry is taught. Um, right. and <laughs> like, what is, what constitutes a good poem, how we're supposed to read poetry and like literature. And I think that it, um, y you mentioned like poetry with a capital P, which I yeah. really associate with like academic poetry. Yes. Um, yes. And, Stuffy. yeah. And like the ways that, um, academic spaces can really, and I have such a fraught relationship with academia. Um, I've always been like one foot in, one foot out. I have a really, yeah, just like love-hate relationship because yeah. it's it's allowed me to focus on my work. This book wouldn't exist if it wasn't for academic spaces or it wouldn't exist in its current form. Um, right. It, it, but there's there's a way that, you know, the culture of academic readings and, you know, the way, um, like the, the formality of it and also it, it taking place within an institution that can be really violent, you know, and is not yeah. nurturing. Um, it's, it's definitely, I think, um, it's sad what it, what it can do to, uh, to someone who is writing, you know, and especially with the tradition of like, um, you know, tearing apart a piece of writing and like destroying someone's like ego and whole sense of self in the process. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's mm -hmm. not necessary. Yep. <laughs> like, what is it, you know, what is this for? And it's like, I fucking love um, reading someone's, um, I know this poet, I'm based in Lisbon, um, Portugal, and uh, I know a, a Portuguese poet who primarily writes in English. Um, so it's not like her first language. And she posts screenshots from her phone notes, which I think a lot of people do. Um, yeah. And I love that. It's a very different experience yeah. encountering a work like in that way, you know, through a screen um, versus like sitting down to read a whole book. But it's like, I, I enjoy reading poetry that way. Um, yeah. And I don't think that it's, I think that everyone who has like the courage to create something and share it deserves a platform, you know? Yeah. Um, and of course, if you're sharing, you're opening yourself up to people having things to say about it. Um, right. But I think that, you know, it's so, um, it's so random in terms of like, who, how do books come about? It's like going through the process of publication for the first time and seeing how involved it is and how much time and energy and effort it's like, yeah. I don't think it really makes sense to hold up certain works as like better or more quality or what we should aspire to. It's like your form yeah. and your way of creating art comes out of your lived experience, comes out of your, um, the time and space you have between like laboring and surviving. And um, yeah, so I think that poetry with a capital P, it's like everyone can have their own capital P. I think that. Yeah, that's a good way yeah, to put it. Like <laughs> we all have our um, our preferences and and things that we're drawn to. And I think that the sort of like academic industry and the poetry industry, um, we just have to be really aware of like what trends are being pushed, what writers are being held up and um, yeah. always like have a mind to, you know, this isn't the end all be all. Like there are lots of ways to um, 
to write poetry and like I want there's a guy um also in uh in Lisbon who's a poet and he travels around the different like viewpoints he walks around and he always um he prints out copies of his poems and folds them and puts a little flower inside um and he has copies in English and in Portuguese and he just comes That's up awesome. to people and he's like yeah I'm get like coins for poems and um I'm like yeah Absolutely. I always yeah. buy, he hasn't switched out the poems in a while. So I have like lots of copies of <laughs> the same, copies. yeah, of the same poem. I'm like, I don't want to be like, got anything new, but <laughs> like, yeah. give me the new yeah, stuff. Yeah, give me the new stuff. Um, but I'm like, that is a, an incredible way of, of sharing, you know, your work. And so I think we have to not be snobby about like self-publishing and um you know there's so much more to the poetry ecosystem than like you know the big prize winners and the best sellers and um yeah always just you know keeping an eye to like what are the grassroots that are nourishing um the conditions where people are creating poetry i think you hit on so much stuff there that i've struggled with from being taught i i didn't go to to a university um i mean i did briefly but i I wasn't taught at the university level about how to read poetry, but I was taught enough by my education to, to carry this fear in me that I'm somehow reading a poem wrong, mm -hmm. that, that I'm interacting with it incorrectly. Like, oh, 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 am I supposed to pause here? Like, how should I? And it took me listening to poets reading their own work out loud or even just people reading any poetry out loud to be like, man, it doesn't matter how you are reading this poem, yeah. like read it. And mm -hmm. however you end up bringing it into yourself and, and thinking about it, that's the way you're, you're doing it. I love that. And yeah. I, I, that's, that's what it eventually took for me to be like, okay, I, I can stop thinking about like, am I reading this correctly? Like I'll just, I'll just read poetry. And that's the, that's the thing. And that you said so much. Yeah. I'm trying to get, no, go and, ahead. and yeah. that's enough. And I love what you said about like, am I reading this incorrectly? And it's like, that is so <laughs> it's just such a devastating fear because it's like, yeah. um, I, I think that, you know, poets are happy if you're reading their work at all. <laughs> like, <Right. they're laughs> right. just, you know, not in terms of <clears throat> readership at large. Um, reader regular readers of poetry is like a you know small percentage of that <laughs> and right. um so i i think that it's like at least for me it is a joy that people are encountering my work and reading it and i'm so grateful yeah. anytime that someone is like you know and i would never want uh someone to approach my work with that lens of like am i getting it am i reading right. this in the right way in the correct way. Um, because I think that it is such a rich medium that allows for so much emergence and so much conversation between work and, and reader. And one of the biggest things that like, I've kind of, that continues to like drive me as a writer and as a creative is like, I want my work to inspire people to write. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's such a big part of it is using your energy to, to create more energy. And I think it's so weird to think that nobody ever made me fear that I was reading a short story wrong. Like that, I, that I never had a teacher that was like, it sounds like you read that wrong. <laughs> or, or I don't even know if anyone said that to me necessarily about poetry or if that's just something that I internalized, mm -hmm. but yeah, well, arriving at a point where I feel freer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it can feel really like, inaccessible you know because like yeah. um a poem in a lot of ways it can also be like a puzzle you know sometimes you get that like immediate direct hit of something where you're like oh my god I, f I feel this and other times it's like wow I have no idea what's happening here <laughs> right. um and I think that's one of the the joys and frustrations of of reading poetry is that it's it can you know it can feel really different also depending on the day or your state of mind when you encounter the poem like you know 
there are poems that I loved years ago that I'm like, ugh, I don't like, <laughs> like, I don't see what I <laughs> saw in that poem. Um, but yeah, it, this is all to say, it's just, it's highly subjective. And I think that, um, you know, we need environments that, that are nurturing people's like encounters with poems. And that's so great that you, um, when you mentioned that like turning point of being in spaces where you were hearing poetry really changed the way that you read it on the page. Um, I think that it's, it's so important to have spaces like that where people can actually hear and feel, um, and, you know, kind of connect with, um, with the human beings that are producing this work. Yeah, I agree. Well, um, Hemorrhaging Wanton Water is out now from Perennial Press. It came out in March of 2023. So if you're listening to this after that, you can go buy it. I'll have links in the show notes and links to Emily's Instagram and all kinds of stuff. Uh, thank you so much for coming on and chatting. This was awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for reading and thank you for your incredible questions. Swing by perennialpress.com to pick up a copy of Emily's book hemorrhaging want and water read about alias read about i whether it's you or emily or a magical every person if you read the book i'd love to know what you think about it you can find me on twitter at austin r wilson or ledger underscore podcast like i mentioned i have a discord server that i've set up and i have that link in my link tree on my twitter but also in the show notes for this very show you're listening to right now so check that out you can also check out my affiliate link on bookshop.org and buy some of the books and and works from the people who've been on the show uh, that's just a way for you to to get something from someone that's not amazon and also to maybe help out my show a little bit in the meantime uh, follow me wherever you get your shows write a review share it with everybody that you can uh, i'd love to hear from you let me know what you think about the show hope you have a good one